So welcome to this uh, session on re transition to renewable energy. I'm uh, Shazia Rafi, President of Air Quality Asia. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, one of my AQA colleagues, uh, Honorable uh, Satya Vidya Yuda, who is a former member of parliament from the House of Representatives of Indonesia. Um, was a member of the Energy Commission um, and was also the founder and chair of the Green Economy Caucus, which is a caucus of members from the Environment, Energy, Finance Commissions of the Parliament, uh, who got together and formed a caucus to be able to work on the whole economy approach to transitioning. And his particular specialty is renewable energy. He is currently a member of the National Energy Council, uh, which is a governmental body of uh, the Republic of Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia this year is in the process of um, enacting uh, a re new and renewable energy bill, which the parliament has been working on. The Green Economy Caucus has been very active on getting that through. And by the end of this year, uh, will uh, be in the you know will be voted in so uh, i turn the floor over to you now pak satya well <clears throat> uh, thank you very much uh, sasya it is an honor for me to deliver the opening remarks of this panel on the transition to renewable energy i remember last time i participated at aqa india strategy session i think back in uh, september 2021 and i noted indonesia optimism yeah, to participate at the Glasgow Summit as we face the challenges and opportunities of energy transition aligned with our nationally determined contributions of uh, getting 29% as business as usual and 41% with the international aids by 2030 emission uh, target reductions. I share this note to highlight the government of Indonesia position that we are taking this really serious in fact, this year, 2022, is an incredible important year for both, I guess, Indonesia and India, because Indonesia holds the G20 uh, presidency and has set three pillars or priority issues for its presidency. First is global health architecture. Second is digital economy transformations. And the third is sustainable energy transitions. At the same time, uh, India is no part of the G20 Troika, working closely with Indonesia and Italy to ensure the consistency and continuity of G20 agenda later in 2023. India has an impressive renewable energy target, I think 40% of installed capacity to be generated from non-fossil sources by 2030. But you did, I mean, uh, India already, and you are reaching this target even now, eight to nine years ahead. I think India has also been said to have a potential to become a global green energy superpower yeah, with clean energy export rising to 500 billion US dollars over the next 20 years. Thus, this panel and conversation and very relevant and timely. Uh, as you may know that Indonesia, as we understand that the primary objective for deploying renewable uh, energy in India is to to advance the economic development, improve energy security and access to energy and also mitigate climate change. Therefore, we hope in 2022 will be the year that we deliver on clean and just energy transitions. Just think about the possibilities here. Renewable energy currently creates five times more jobs than fossil fuel. The number of renewable energy jobs grew from 1.7 million in 2004 to 10.3 million in 2017 and 11.5 million <clears throat> in 2019. This is according to the annual review from the International Renewables uh, Energy Agency, IRENA. So let me uh, share a few notes today on Indonesia Homeworks as G20 chair in pursuing potential areas of collaborations that can ensure that energy transition is achievable for all and particularly developing countries, uh, including one is the energy accessibility, the acceleration of the development and deployment of most effective solution and help them rapidly achieve cost parity and also commercial viability. The second is clean and smart energy technology 
enabling the transition toward low chem emission power system, which include promoting development, deployment, and dissemination of economically viable zero or low carbon emission and renewables technology. And the third, the innovative fin financing for energy transition, scaling up finance, mobilizing public and private finance, developing innovative financing scheme, and attracting private finance to support green, inclusive, and sustainable energy de development in developing country. Fourth is scale up public research, development, and also deployment. Cooperation on capacity building and technology development through key global initiative, joint or bilateral project. As you may know that during COP29, uh, 26 in Glasgow yeah, recently, Indonesia was supported by several countries such as uh, UK, Germany, and other European countries to form a group called FIRE, Friend of Indonesia on Renewable Energy. This initiative will assist Indonesia to achieve the reduction of uh, emission as stated in our NDC is about 29% in 2030 with business as usual, I mentioned earlier, to become 41% with the international aid. Indonesia has set to achieve net zero transition uh, emission by 2060. So therefore we exercise around 9.2 gigawatt of coal-based fire plant to stop operation by 2030 or earlier. So through fire, we hope that we could achieve the target. And around 5.5 gigawatt coal fire plants will be early retired and replaced by lower emissions, not necessary to be renewables. And they will contribute to reduce the emission up 36 million tons CO2 with the total investments around 26 billion US dollars. While the remaining 3.7 gigawatt will be early retired and replaced by renewables sources. It will contribute to reduction emission around 53 million ton CO2, with the total investment is 22 billion US dollars. So 8 billion to stop coal fire plants and 14 billion US dollars for renewables uh, energy power plants. So another example, I think the partnership like uh, South Africa, France, Germany, UK, US, and EU, EU for a just energy transition provide a possible example to be deployed in other countries and region to support global uh, decarbonizations. I think through sufficient resources and collaboration, we can achieve huge strides toward a sustainable world. So as can, yes, you can see that we are actively looking for doors to open the way for further climate progress, accelerating uh, the green economy reforms and sustainable energy transition. So we hope that both Indonesia and India a potential green energy superpower can galvanize the necessary momentum to achieve this goal. I think that's my uh, opening remarks and thank you for your attention. So therefore I hand over to Dr. Sally as a moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Honorable Satya Vidya Yudha for setting the right uh, context for this panel discussion, which we will now proceed with. And uh, you very rightly um, highlighted the pillars which are very essential for uh, renewable energy transitions, which does not just include uh, policy <clears throat> finance as, as well as uh, technology, uh, you know, the existing technology, but also new research, because I think this is one area which is often overlooked because we need to also understand the limitations of current technologies. Uh, and uh, continue to like research and invest in research and innovation. Uh, so that's a very important aspect. And I also like the term of green energy superpower because uh, indeed as developing countries, both, both India and Indonesia will have to move in the direction of clean energy. Thank you so much, Honorable uh, Satya Vidya Yudha for setting that tone. I would now like to move on to our panel discussion, which is on uh, transition to renewable energy. Uh, as has been also highlighted by our speaker, central to, the cl to climate action and addressing energy poverty is renewable energy transitions. Renewable en energy transitions are at the core of realizing the objectives of the Paris Agreement, as well as goal seven of the Sustainable Development Goals. India's own aspirational goal by 2030 is that of 500 gigawatt of installed power generation capacity through non-fossil fuels and 50% of its electricity requirement from renewables by 2030. 
what are renewable energy transitions renewable energy transitions involve a pathway towards transformation of energy systems from being the being from the state of being carbon intensive to a state of being low carbon or zero carbon through large scale deployment of supply and demand side renewable energy measures including technology innovation policy instruments as well as financing energy transitions involve deploying these instruments to drive systemic transformation of energy systems as well as to avoid carbon lockouts several discursive elements have found their place in the energy transition story these elements include technological transformations just transitions people centric transitions low carbon pathways and net zero transitions as markets go bullish on clean energy technologies and renewable technologies in particular and pressures mount to move away from fossil fuel energy systems government across the world will intensify their efforts to deploy renewable energy technologies along with questions around policy and technology measures needed for renewable energy transitions critical and inconvenient questions should also be asked on aspects concerning federal issues availability of raw material including critical minerals and life cycle approaches to renewable energy technologies to that end this session is aimed at both policy as well as critical reflections on energy transitions including federal perspectives financial limitations and opportunities as well as the story around inclusive energy transitions in this session uh, i i uh, i'm also very pleased to note that all the three panelists um that will follow uh, my uh, that will follow um, you know uh, that will follow once i introduce them are women and uh, also i think that women uh, themselves are very central to the energy transition story with this i would now like to invite the first panelist as listed on the agenda ms sandhya sundara raghavan uh, ms sandhya is the lead of energy transitions at wri india and sandhya to you i'd like you do shed um, some light on challenges related to federal or central state aspects related to renewable energy transitions based on your research and experience also will you share some perspectives on technologies such as energy storage and green hydrogen over to you sandhya thank you so much shelly and um, without further ado um, well, i think we are all on the same page that there has been significant growth in rd capacity in the last 15 years and this could not have been possible without clear national you know policies long term and which provides long term direction and confidence to investors markets policy makers and various other stakeholders uh, some of these measures as we see is uh, you know the must run status rpo targets fiscal incentives um, all india synchronous grid and even the all india power market these are all some of the landmark achievements now at the state level we see that the state utility is at a crossroads in terms of uh, you know going for a sustainable electricity grid and clean supply mix uh, there is also the issue of uh, some of the utilities which are in serious debt burden and which impacts the ability for investors to invest in re uh, with along with that there is also a need for modernizing the transmission and distribution infrastructure to accommodate this increase in renewable energy so while we see that there have been efforts to address the power supply deficits and um, the idea to move away from fossil fuel sources some of the uh, states are continuing to add thermal capacity in tandem with renewable um, energy sources which defeats the core purpose of moving towards a sustainable uh, you know transition energy transition so what we need to see is we need an integrated long term planning approach so it's not just about energy transition in terms of resources but it is also a transition that we need to see in the way the electricity institutions operate um and the approach that they take in mitigating these challenges so utility of 2030 is going to look very different we need to see it from a systems point of view and there are going to be challenges from states perspective as well because they need to keep the development priorities in mind uh, but then we did see during covid 19 that Uh, even though there were challenges due to migration earning livelihood challenges especially in the state of tamil nadu renewable energy was actually a lifeline 
during the covid lockdown period second most important thing which uh, uh, you know we spoke about is uh, briefly touched upon was the role of new technologies the you know that's going to play a very critical it's going to be play a very critical aspect in the uh, energy states energy transition so going forward planners they need to emphasize that new technologies should be as a part of solution rather than completely having it as a new system so that exploring these options will include flexibility uh, which is both at the supply side as well as at the demand side and this should be integrated as a part of the planning process so especially the new and mature technologies must be integrated during the capacity generation planning exercises and for example energy storage uh, which we are seeing is going to become an important pillar of energy transition and it needs to be done uh, in tandem with the renewable capacity addition the recent budget announcement has allocated the infrastructure status to grid scale battery storage and uh, coupled with all the provisions that are mentioned in the energy storage draft policy i think it's going to play a very favorable pathway for transformative clean tech uh, clean tech innovation um we can also see that implementing storage is seen as a solution to not just manage the intermittency but they can also provide ancillary support which will go in tandem with the new market mechanisms that have evolved like real uh, real time market and green term ahead market the second uh, important uh, technology that we see now is the green hydrogen so um, what we can see is the surplus rd power can be utilized to produce green hydrogen which in turn can be used for multiple applications so the private sector can also take this as a cue to develop sustainable and innovative business models um uh, especially for battery uh, uh, you know which can be used as a service and that is going to open up this entire gamut of possibilities to integrate battery infrastructure with renewables which is going to again help in contributing to the growth of the sector aid in job creation while also mitigating pollution so the idea is at the state level we need to look at diverse uh, portfolio mix of technologies going beyond utility scale solar and onshore wind in this next phase of energy transition we could look at distributed renewable energy sources we could look at small wind turbines green hydrogen offshore wind and that would actually provide that flexibility in the system and also help in supporting livelihoods and vulnerable vulnerable communities so with that i would like to um hand it over to you shelly thank you so much uh, sandhya and thank you so much for finishing it before your allocated time of 5 minutes uh, i'd like to now move on to the next uh, panelist as listed on the agenda ms vibhuti garg uh, vibhuti is an energy economist at the institute of energy economics and financial analysis the two questions that i pose to you vibhuti can you share some uh, shed some light on the financing of renewable energy transitions what would be the role of governments in financing and what would be the role of markets over to you vibhuti thanks thanks shelly and a very good morning to everyone um i will just start with you know just putting things in context first so climate change is being witnessed increasingly now in extreme weather events uh, and it is coming becoming one of the biggest threat to both energy as well as the financial market and also to the vulnerable uh, groups and people as well as the communities now in order to mitigate this climate risk india as well as other countries globally are now setting ambitious renewable energy targets and which is a very welcome move to kind of see a uh, lot of countries kind of committing to such ambitions now this transition has become even more critical you know um, in the present scenario where reliance on expensive fossil fuels is becoming increasingly riskier we are seeing today or in the last few months the price volatility of oil and gas especially and even coal has exposed the vulnerability of nations you know relying on such expensive fuels in recent times oil and gas prices have been extremely volatile reaching unprecedented kind of lows in 2020 where you know uh, the, the we witness the prices being so low uh close to even 50 uh, us dollars per barrel but now we are seeing increasingly an all time highs in 2021 as well as now with this increasing uh, tension between russia and ukraine you know the prices have gone over the roof so in this context even more it becomes very uh, you know relevant for 
all the countries to transition to renewable energy and which will also enable the government to meet their other objectives of whether it's energy security it's self reliance job creation uh, which sanjay also pointed out and also kind of reducing uh, imports of expensive fossil fuels and thereby the import bill so the kind of savings government can entail by transitioning to renewable energy apart from the benefits of climate i think uh, there are more fiscal uh, incentives as well so uh, given uh, where everybody needs to go so um, at cop 26 in glasgow prime minister modi announced 500 gigawatts of non fossil fuel capacity and 50% from renewable energy sources by 2030 coupled with also net zero target by 2070 so as a result what we are increasingly seeing is uh, that this growth is being now uh, the incremental growth is now being led by renewable energy capacity addition in financial year 2020 21 till january 22 uh, you know india added about 11.4 gigawatt of renewable energy against 1.2 gigawatt of uh, coal based capacity so this kind of shows where uh, the investments are going where uh, you know more capacity is coming up uh, so definitely there is transition happening but we need to accelerate that now transition to renewable energy is also kind of synonymous with countries committing to net zero so while it would include more uh, demand side measures like uh, also include like energy efficiency carbon capture storage etc but the larger focus uh, for achieving this net zero would be on the supply side by increasing deployment of renewable energy so now i would like to present it from the financing perspective so what it means for, uh, you know in terms of investment requirements uh, when we talk about these net zero commitments 2021 you know we had uh, increasingly number of countries committing to uh, net zero about 140 countries covering 90% of global emissions as well as 410 publicly traded companies and 450 financial institutions representing uh 130 us dollar trillion and assets have announced net zero targets while indian companies have been slow in joining this rate to uh, race to net zero uh but they are starting to get their act together some of the india's biggest companies such as tata reliance mahindra and quite a few many others have made net zero announcements whereas government corporations like indian railways and even chatisgarh Uh, health department have also committed to achieve net zero emissions by 2030 and 2050 respectively so now when we look at about uh, what it means for india's uh, investment requirements so while uh, detailed sectoral studies on india's net zero emission is yet to be done um, the iia india energy outlook 2021 presented various scenarios including the sustainable development scenario which is kind of consistent with the longer term drive to net zero um this study kind of illustrates the net zero roadmap but uh, the goal post has shifted uh, from 2070 to 2050 so this implies that the transition to renewable energy and farming capacity will have to accelerate relative to that mapped out in the sds scenario um if we look at the short term target of 2030 the expected annual investment uh, would be to the tune of about uh, 110 billion us dollars uh, for india uh, which means india would need investments of uh, 1.1 us dollar trillion between the period 2021 to 2030 this is about if you look at from the perspective of what's happening today so india is investing about us 40 billion dollars uh, uh, in the sector so which needs to be kind of uh, increased by almost three times and that's the kind of investment that needs to flow in the sector and which can be done india needs to exploit the rapidly growing pool, pool of global capital from sovereign wealth funds global pension funds private equity infrastructure funds as well as global utilities plus oil and gas majors now which who are increasingly now pivoting to clean energy but struggling to find the right infrastructure projects at a scale esg uh, private capital institutional investors green bonds sustainability linked bonds 
uh, infrastructure investment funds these are all different instruments through which just wrap up in one yeah, just, just uh, yeah i'm just going to wrap up in uh, next 30 seconds so these are some of the big instruments that needs to be targeted uh, in order to accelerate more investment into uh, the sector so we are on the right path but we need to accelerate that transition now uh, the building blocks to achieve uh, are being set right we are seeing right set of policies now being announced uh, both the public and the private sector are upbeat and being uh, are being kind of taking this uh, part of energy transition journey policy certainty will be a key factor for developer as well as investor confidence and once that is ensured i think there's no looking back uh thankfully uh, i hope i didn't uh, kind of was well within my time period uh, but yeah uh, that's the key uh, points i wanted to make happy to take on any questions later Thanks a lot, Vibhuti. I will leave, leave the summary to uh, you know once all the panelists have uh, made the intervention. I would now like to invite the third panelist as listed on the agenda, Ms. Disha Agarwal. Uh, Disha is a program lead in renewables at CEW. And Disha, to you, I pose the questions according to you. What would be the two or three crit 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 critical priorities that must form the core of renewable energy transitions in India? And how can renewable energy transitions be more inclusive? Over to you, Disha. Yeah, thank you, Shelly. I think uh, uh, both Sandhya and Vibhuti have covered very valuable uh, points uh, before me. So I will uh, just like to uh, either add or compliment to what um, they have said. Um, and, and to the very pertinent question that you have posed, uh, we know that India has been at the forefront of adopting innovative solutions, approaches to boost the renewable energy sector. Um, and now, of course, we brace ourselves to meet the ambitious targets announced at the COP26. And um, of, I would like to discuss some critical priorities uh, that uh, must be central to India's uh, transition strategy for this decade. Um, so uh, I very much agree, actually, with what Sandhya said, that um, we must, as a country, we must build a decentralized uh, technology mix to bring the energy transition closer to communities. So um, over the last decade, we have seen that uh, solar PV, uh, utility scale solar PV has got a lot of attention because the policymakers at that point in time wanted to focus on uh, cost reduction and achieve the economies of scale. Uh, however, at this juncture where we stand, uh, we need to promote alternate technologies uh, and applications, including rooftop uh, decentralized uh, applications of solar and wind, both, um, as well as look at hydro and biomass power. And, um, you know, there, there could be certain innovative uh, business models um, and uh, procurement approaches, which the government bodies should now start looking at and should now start demonstrating um, because we already know that there are challenges in um, you know, acquiring land or transmission connectivity and evacuation uh, when it comes to um, you know, higher concentration of projects, uh, both solar and wind, that we see in the western and the southern parts of the country. Um, so only two states, for example, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat, they, almost, they host almost 50% of the total wind capacity today in the country. Similarly, like floating solar has huge potential where eastern states of the country like um, uh, Jharkhand, Odisha, all of them have huge uh, potential uh, where estimates suggest oh, close to 2400 gigawatts of such plants, um, uh, you know, can, can be looked at. So, um, uh, you know, these states kind of cannot host these big uh, large scale solar and wind plants. So why not look at these kinds of opportunities? Although we know that prices or costs of these uh, applications would be slightly higher, but we also know that decentralizing uh, the whole mix will uh, accrue a lot of socioeconomic desired socioeconomic benefits today. So, um, you know, pilots, business models, looking at opportunities like, uh, you know, agricultural based solar microgrids or, or microgrids with storage. Uh, we also know that there are pilots happening in the country today where we are looking to integrate uh, rooftop solar with EV charging, for example, for 100% green mobility. We know that there are uh, companies that are coming forward, uh, converting kitchen waste to biogas, for example, for transportation purposes. 
um so all of these opportunities need to be looked at um and uh, as per uh, estimates also we know that all of these decentralized uh, applications um generate far more number of jobs uh, than utility scale applications to just give you a perspective for every 4 gigawatt of new rooftop solar we could create 50000 jobs so um so therefore you know these kinds of systems can provide local reliable affordable solutions to consumers and offset the emissions um not only during generation but also across supply chains um and secondly what i would like to say that the key uh, you know the pillar of our transition strategy would be demand creation organic demand creation for renewable so again like um uh, sandhyan vibhuti said uh, from the resources side a lot of uh, attention is being given uh, but we know that there is a um, lot of bottlenecks uh, on the demand side uh, we know that of course the electricity distribution companies which are the major uh, buyers of renewable energy today um are uh, are financially stressed um and uh, the the commercial and industrial consumers who are uh, generally the first movers and would be the you know the demand uh, centers in in our system um today their hands are tied and they are not able to move um to shift to cheaper renewable energy resources um for example today under open access only 12% of the total utility scale capacity um, is under open access so we know that evidently there are you know constraints in the system in moving towards cheaper renewables but however of course um new technologies like storage uh, you know advancements are happening uh, costs are declining um and so going forward discoms must take advantage of these developments and see how they can best serve the needs of their high paying consumers um and and also you know how we can free those distribution companies from with their old and inefficient um, you know coal power plants to create that headroom that they require to purchase more renewable energy and other flexible resources through other market based platforms um is also something that needs to be central to the strategy um third and most importantly i'd say that we need to transform our institutions meeting the 2030 targets um is not um easy we need to fast track deployment we need to improve our efficiency of implementation we need to strengthen our procurement processes and we need to um, ensure transparency across different uh, sets of stakeholders when it comes to either resources uh, resource potential information or grid integration or infrastructure information so it calls for a you know creation of mechanisms for a quicker resolution of um challenges uh, disputes on contracts on payment delays so um, these uh, you know these roles have to be played by some dedicated uh, entity who deals with this issue and ensures a coordinated sort of systematic development of projects and improved center state coordination as well um lastly i would just say that uh, as a country we would need to think beyond just energy energy provision um uh, to to the poorest of the poor consumers uh, need to go beyond um you know energy provision as a service but also think about their skilling um their you know financing needs um establishing market linkages for the products um that they are producing you know small businesses farmers uh and it needs a convergence basically across multiple actors in the energy and the livelihood uh, domain um so uh, at cw we have this program called powering livelihoods uh, which is of uh, the aim of this program is to mainstream clean uh, energy based livelihood solutions for by providing capital technical support sectoral growth support to to these productive um, end use uh, enterprises uh, in rural areas such as uh cold storages uh textile looms rice mills uh, sewing machines etc so the moment basically the ex- you know we expand the horizon to dre based uh, livelihood we automatically unlock a lot of jobs and livelihood opportunities um and uh, for example uh, you know a solar based coal storage uh, could augment incomes for as 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 much as 100 farmers um in 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 a village and uh, you know in terms of agro processing units um several farmers uh, farmer producer organizations are engaged in where there's a huge opportunities for these uh, applications post harvesting processing activities 
um so significant potential there in textile chains and small refrigeration uh, based just just in 30 minutes if you could yeah. wrap up please yeah i'm just wrapping up so uh, in you know in sectors like dairy and fisheries also so therefore we need um, creation and pushing of platforms that explicitly focus on uh, mainstreaming these uh, productive use uh, applications and enterprises so that um, you know our energy transition can become more inclusive and just and takes takes along um, you know all all uh, the consumers whether it be rich or, or the poor so with that i'd like to hand it over to you shelly thank you thank you for your thank you thank you so much uh, disha and thank you so much to all the panelists so we've uh, listened to three very interesting perspectives you know uh, from sandhya we heard about the challenges that state utilities face uh, but also you know about the flexibility that is needed on both the supply and demand side where again solutions like battery storage is extremely crucial uh from vibhuti we heard about the financing need and the fact that you know there has been the incremental growth in energy is also been fueled by renewable energy shows that there is financing going there but then much more is needed and of course there are studies there are various studies including by iea including by terry including by cw and their estimates differ as to you know what would it uh, uh take for countries to go to net zero or india to go to net zero uh, but nevertheless what is clear is that we need at least triple the amount of financing which is going uh, you know uh, in, uh, presently uh, also what uh, um, uh, disha shared was very interesting perspective about the differences in geographies and the amount of the the type of technologies that could be deployed or even the scale of technologies that could be deployed and the very fact that uh, you know livelihoods should be at the center of uh, any renewable energy solutions whether uh, you know and there are many models that exist uh, in terms of uh, dre or distributed uh, renewable energy solutions which can help micro enterprises uh, you know whether uh, you know even terry has worked on a couple of models which even includes like fishermen you know small uh, micro small medium enterprises so definitely the livelihood aspect and the opportunities which we create uh, in uh, including in rural uh, in uh, including in rural areas is extremely crucial uh, so i just like to uh, you know maybe like because there's not much time left maybe just do a quick quick rapid uh, fire round because one of the things which in a way also is needed is more research and more innovation that goes into developing newer technologies than what we have today uh so you know just one question i'd like to pose to all of you and maybe we can just do a quick round in the order of uh, speakers listed in the agenda uh is you know what can be done to propel more research and innovation on renewable energy trans uh, on renewable energy technologies thanks shelly and i can i can go first so i think um in terms of inclusivity and just transition that uh, that came up i think it's also important to uh keep it inclusive in the planning process where we have various civil society organizations academic institutions stakeholders both at the state and central level are involved in these processes and like we see for example at the state level the vision documents should be seen in tandem with solar and wind policies policy frameworks should include that innovative coordination and financing mechanisms and again we have to see ari if ari can support the development priorities as well as the challenges right so building that skill force looking at better resource management and not just looking at electricity sector in isolation but also looking the role of reliable electricity in improving the delivery of say critical services like education and health so i think there i think it's going to play a very important role where we we are seeing that uh, there are investments in ari but again can we prioritize investments in clean energy so that there is sustainable development can we actually see that the electricity and development sectors are coming together can we think of more like an integrated approach uh, you know to uh, uh, basically ensure that there are more clear strategic actionable plans um, leveraging the long term analytical capacity that we have here you know in our audience as well as uh, you know like in academia and civil society organizations uh, in think tanks um as well as various stakeholders who are interested in this can we actually come together to articulate that low carbon job creating climate resilient just transition pathway 
for India and at the state level. I think that's something that we need to look out for. Vibhuti? Yeah. Um, socially, to your question of how do we kind of, uh, you know, ensure more R&D happening for the uh, cleaner technology. So definitely there has been some allocation from the government budget, but that has been uh, so insufficient and very low in terms of, you know, uh, India kind of prioritizing more R&D in this space. So definitely we uh, kind of need to increase that. We need to provide more impetus on R&D. Uh, because if you look at from the solar module manufacturing so far, uh, the players in India were, uh, you know, developing uh, a technology which is now no more kind of being uh, deployed. So we had to, uh, in terms of making our products more efficient, more, uh, you know, uh, to match the global standards, we, de- we need to kind of enhance more uh, R&D as well as get more budget. And secondly, the kind of trends that we are seeing and uh, which is again on the right path is these companies like Reliance uh, kind of acquiring or some stakes uh, in the technologies of the future, whether it's C-Stair, whether it's next wave. So what is happening now is more exchange of technologies uh, through these acquisitions by these big players like Reliance and Adani. So now we are seeing that change happening, but Again, in order to provide more world-class products, more efficient products, more R&D and technology needs to happen. And government can, again, play a pivotal role in kind of in, in ensuring that happens through more uh, budgetary support and kind of making it mandatory to kind of uh, for these companies to produce the newest generation products and not relying on very, very old technologies, which has been the case so far. So that's what my stance is, yeah. Disha? Yeah, thanks, Shelly. So I had quick two observations. So on the R&D, I think um, because our energy transition journey, uh, of course, presents a lot of challenges as well as opportunities, I think uh, India must look to strike some collaborative R&D programs with other countries, developed countries, because they are obligated to provide uh, climate finance to India. Um, so and and a lot of it will uh, you know revolve around uh, technology innovation as well as demonstration for different use cases across uh, residential and industrial commercial sectors in India. So I think as part of that obligation, there is an obligation also to provide uh, you know to you know do this collaborative R and D with you know some kind of shared IP uh, or common IP uh, you know rights. It shouldn't uh, rest with you know all the you know the technology development that is happening in. Um, the developed countries, uh, because uh, this is a common goal uh, to move towards net zero or, you know, to stay beyond, uh, stay within the limit of 1.5 degrees. So that's one. The other thing I think uh, would be the role of catalytic finance facilities um, that, again, the government could look at um, leveraging um, uh, smaller amounts of public patient capital, but um, use it to leverage or crowd in, in you know, private um, investments uh, or or capital, uh, you know, which is normally risk averse. Um, so how, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, catalytic finance facilities can help uh, support technologies and mod- business models, which are not yet proven, uh, but need to be demonstrated on the ground to build that confidence um, in, in investors and, you know, other classes of investors um, or developers such that that scale up can happen. So those were my two observations. Thank you. Yeah. Very quickly, Sandhya, uh, the one point that you wanted to make, and then you know I'll just wrap up the session. Thank you. Sure. I think I think um, uh, kind of echo with Disha and Vibhuti on this. Uh, we also need to encourage more startups. I think there are these uh, uh, different uh, you know techathons, challenges uh, where we can invite more startups and entrepreneurs working in the RE uh, space, and that I, I think that will also help in creating that innovation hub, um, inviting more, uh, you know, uh, companies, uh, both at the startup MSME and at the large scale level to actually compete and uh, show different solutions and innovative business models. I think that's also one way where we can learn from each other. And uh, one important thing is we should also create a space, a platform where we can actually share that information across different states and utilities and um, and also bringing that international expertise that Disha mentioned. Yeah. Over to you, Shiv. Thanks. 
Thank you so much. So um, yes, since we are nearing the end of the session, I'd just like to summarize very briefly, I mean, uh, from the few points that we have discussed now. So of course, one of the biggest, uh, you know, the, the key takeaways that I have that, you know, uh, we need uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, an enabling environment for uh, encouraging uh, renewable energy innovations and uh, R&D is of course, one is more budgetary allocation but also to you know, encourage think tanks coming together and to articulate the larger, bigger picture, but also to encourage startups. I mean, you know, in India, we have Make in India, we have Startup India, you know, we have all these campaigns. So we do need to encourage startups also to kind of venture out into new technology and innovation spaces. And it's not that we should just stop at the Make in India story, but we have to research and develop in India and create in India, you know, right from the conceptual or innovation or even technology uh, states. So which, with this, you know, I'd just like to uh, close this session and over to the organizers. Thank you so much.